Hello there, everyone, and welcome to this on the record briefing. My name is David Akana. Three more days to go, and the curtains will be drawn on the ongoing 15th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations uh, Convention to Combat Desertification here in Abidjan. Keep in mind that this is the largest international gathering of a coalition of actors to discuss land and its implication to a whole host of issues, notably biodiversity, climate, gender, youth, migration, drought, sun and dust dumps, et cetera, et cetera. And with less than 72 hours to go, the question becomes, where are the parties with respect to the overall negotiations? Are we uh, getting closer to a consensus on some of the issues that were at stake? Are we getting some sticky points? And if yes, what are those sticky points? Are we getting closer to an agreement? Because by Friday, there should be a final report to obviously sanction this overall conference of the parties, the 15th. We would explore all these issues at this morning's briefing with someone who spends practically their whole day and night reporting about this conference. But first, allow me to say that this briefing is brought to you by the F Journalism Network, the Robert Bosch Stifton, in collaboration with the United Nations Convention uh, to Combat Desertification, the UNCCD. As usual, we shall have uh, the briefer provide us an introductory statement, perhaps less with the case of Garrett, who is going to just practically answer our questions but more with our uh, Canadian uh, friend who is connected this morning to speak to us a little bit about the Canadian support to climate action in Sub-Saharan Africa. So who are our briefers this morning? First, we have Gerrit Hansen, and am I correct in terms of the pronunciation? Excellent, great. So she's a researcher, political advisor, and independent consultant. She joined the F Negotiation Bulletin as a writer in 2019. Her expertise spans international climate policy, attribution of climate impact, green finance, renewable energy technologies, carbon dioxide removal options, and climate resilience or resilient sustainable development. Gerrit holds a doctorate from the uh, Wegging, uh, Wegginigin. Excellent. I'm not going to try to pronounce them more than twice. Uh, but that's a university in the Netherlands, well known, uh, a diploma in environmental engineering from the Technical University in Berlin, and a master's of science degree in global change management from the University of Sustainable uh, Development um, that's in Ebbets Wild. Uh, former employers have included, you know, research institutes, UN organizations, government agencies, think tanks, and NGOs. So that's what Gary is all about. Great. And we are glad that we have you this morning for our briefing. We shall also have a second briefer. In this case, we have, shall have Laurent uh, uh, Domeni. Uh, he is a member of uh, Econoles, uh, which is um, Econoles team of international uh, energy experts. He holds a master's degree in energy engineering and renewable energy and is currently a PhD student in physics, specialized in providing consulting services uh, regarding energy efficiency, renewable energies, electricity and heat transfer. Mr. Domini uh, has more than 11 years of professional experience in the area of um, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energies, access to energy, clean development mechanism, which is a CDM and solar uh, PVs. He is a certified measurement and verification professional and a certified energy manage, uh, manager by the Association of Energy Engineers of Canada. He is also certified as an international certified uh, climate and renewable energy finance expert from the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management and holds a solar PV professional certification uh, uh, by the Renewable Academy in Berlin. So we are obviously going to hear from him. Uh, currently, uh, Mr. Domini is a renewable energy advisor of the expert deployment mechanism of the Climate Action in Africa project. So with him, we're going to speak a little bit about the Canadian government's commitment to climate action in Sub-Saharan Africa, the opportunity and benefits of soft-soft cooperation and project process and the eligibility of, uh, for Sub-Saharan African countries. But then before we get into our different briefers, it is important to just speak a little bit about what is going on at the COP. And I think in this case, I'm, I'm so glad that we have uh, Garrett with us this morning. Uh, we spent an entire day yesterday. We've had a dialogue in the last two days, practically speaking about how you get the NGOs or CSOs to be able to participate in the overall process of the UNCCD. I know you developed a whole bulletin on this uh, for uh, Tuesday, uh, May 17th. We just want to highlight some of the things that have been going on at that level before we get into some of the negotiation process as well. Well, yeah, um, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, as uh, David just pointed out, so I'm a writer for the Earth Negotiation Bulletin. We uh, follow the official negotiations. That means we have access to all the 
open plenary sessions, but we are also kind of in a similar situation as the observer groups and NGOs in that we do not really have access to the formal negotiations behind closed doors like contact groups, informal sessions, friends of the chair group, where a lot of the more um, political, impactful, let's say, uh, uh, negotiations are taking place. Um, so on Tuesday uh, during, and also last week during the open dialogue session with the, um, with the civil society groups, we already saw uh, quite a few uh, delegations actually pleading for better access for uh, civil society groups, for observers, for admitted observers, at least for representatives, so that uh, more transparency can be guaranteed. And also they said it is very important since they were highlighting the, the incredibly important work that is being done on the ground by CSO and the expertise that they bring, could bring back to this multilateral process about what actually works on the ground and you know, what decisions should be taken in order to enable um, impactful uh, and facilitate imp impactful and, and inclusive uh, implementation. It would be really important to actually have those groups Within the uh, within the closed sessions, as is the practice also in some of other of the other conventions, um, but I cannot uh, really say anything about the progress that we've seen on that. Um, because as far as I know, it's also not yet been decided, and it's still under negotiation. So we have what some groups are very vocal about that. I think Canada is one of them. The EU is one of them. Also, the US sometimes is supporting. Um, the better access for observer groups to the negotiations in addition to the format that we have at the moment, which is an open dialogue session twice in, during the, the, the course of this COP, um, where delegates can interact and listen and, and ask questions um, to presentations from civil society uh, groups from across the globe, representing all the regional, um, the regional um, uh, groups that are uh, part of, of this convention. Um, but it would be from our uh, standpoint, of course, uh, 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 from the standpoint of transparency, but also according to impact, it would be very helpful to have more participation from, you know, those that represent directly affected groups within the official service. And let us say, Garrett, that uh, the uh, UNCCD is an international platform, mostly at origin interstate. A platform where states meet to discuss specific issues, in this case of the UNCCD issues about land, but over time they found out that it was important to open up to others, so not only uh, uh, civil society, but private sector uh, businesses, uh, you know, uh, NGOs and all of that. So I think it's important that we put this within context and that over time CSOs actually want to participate in the process, in part because if you want to make this uh, inclusive, they all have to be in the room, right? So there's been two days of intense discussion about that and almost all of yesterday's dialogues were focused on that, isn't it? Sure, actually, I'm very sorry, David, that... Um... No, I'm saying most of the discussions yesterday were focused on how you get CSOs to participate in the process. Yes, and I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure what you're talking about. I'm very sorry. Excellent. No, the bottom line <laughs> is I'm just simply saying that a lot of the discussions yesterday were focused on the CSOs. That's what you reported on the FG, uh, uh, negotiation bulletin. We, we, right. had the, we had the, mor the morning session, the open dialogue right. session by the CSOs, which is part of the official COP agenda, and right. uh, which is a very important vehicle, and it's very special to this convention. Exactly. So there, That's what there I'm referring was, yes. to. Okay, so yeah. sorry, so there I, was was, a morning I did not understand. There was a morning session that was entirely focused on how you then get CSOs to be able to participate more in the process, get their voices on the table. Uh, it was not entirely focused on that. It was actually focused on a thematic issue, the issue of agroecology, uh, which is a very important issue, which is very close to the hearts of many of the groups of participating here. We see this as a holistic solution to many of the problems that we have. But within the session, of course, there was also a lot of um, a debate about how to improve observer access to the, uh, to the formal negotiations because as I said before, that is one of the um, you know, recurring themes that everybody's talking about, that inclusiveness is important, the representation of marginalized groups is important, the representations of those that are most affected is important. But since this is obviously a party-driven process and a state-driven process, there is of course also this tension of you know, you know, who can participate in what rounds. Exactly. And just to say it, I think it is also very legitimate and important that the country parties do have their closed spaces where they can talk private, say, like you know, privately and openly and, and, and confidentially. So, and it is also it would be uh, difficult to say what well, NGOs should have the same status in a way 
as a uh, member state because it's just a different constituency. But there are ways, obviously, that is, is, um, at least observing and having access to listen and, and follow what is actually happening and maybe give some input I may not negotiate as a you know kind of on, on, on the same at the same level, but at least be able to like give input and react to what's happening, and also through transparency that is important corrective function of civil society. And there are a lot of steps that could be taken to improve that. In this Excellent, great, thank you so much, Gary. Would you want to give us a sense? There's also the committee or several uh, work going on at the level of the committee for the review of the implementation of the convention. There's also the 15th session of the Committee of Science and Technology that's going on. Do you want to speak a little bit with respect to progress of work at that level? Yes, very happy to, David. So let me start with the Committee on Science and Technology. So that work was already concluded last week. Um, they had uh, a very, very high workload because usually they were, have like four or four and a half days time for their program. And this time, because at this COP, well, the high level segment, which usually happens during the second week, happened at the beginning. So it was kind of a very big kickoff, giving momentum to the conference, but that also meant for them, they had to compress their, their content related work into three days or two and a half days. And uh, they managed to do that. And it was a, a it was very good and very constructive discussion. Um, they worked a lot on, on issues related to integrated land use planning, uh, to drought and also sand and dust storms. And so they concluded last week on Friday already, which was kind of the first uh, success, I think, big success of this of this convention that they actually managed to pull through. And then we had a science day on Saturday, which right. was in the Rio pavilion, which really was also a, 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 a we, we were kind of concerned, to be honest, before, because we said, oh, it's on a Saturday, there are no official negotiations, it's on a weekend, will there really be people you know, attending this important event. And, and then suddenly everyone showed. It was showed. buzzing, it was really busy, everybody was very engaged, people were happy, and that also shows how important science and scientific input and exchange with researchers is for this convention. Um, so yeah, that was the CST. And then the CRIC, um, um, the, the CRIC open uh, started, the CRIC is still continuing its work. And do you want us to speak what's the CRIC all about? Because uh, yeah. these are acronyms that most of our participants are not familiar with. Yeah, so that's the uh, committee uh, for the uh, review of the implementation of the convention. Exactly. So they are um, actually looking at the progress that is being made. They also meet intersessionally. So they meet between the COPs um, to just review how the, uh, the, the, the framework um, and the strategy of the convention is being implemented on the ground. And they, um, they may, I, I mean, of course, there are a couple of administrators and management issues always on the agenda. Um, but the main thing they are uh, negotiating here, or they're talking about here, are the uh, thematic issues. Um, so um, there are policy frameworks and uh, thematic issues under the CRIC, um, which concern it's, uh, one is gender, then there's migration, sand and dust storms, drought, and land tenure. And for all of those, there are, there are some texts have been produced. Um, about how to do we know what language we have in that text already? Um, well, there is a draft. There is a draft language that is available, but okay. the uh, and um, actually the negotiations during this week were quite slow. So they are working on this in so-called contact groups, which are closed. Um, so we do not really have a. We just have you know the the information that we get from delegates that will give us some feedback or the, the chairs that may give us some feedback just a quick question gary i know yes. i'm sorry to interrupt you yeah. you know unlike the cop where usually there's a lot of contentious issues to discuss yeah. are we having that with respect to this committee that you just talked about the committee to review the implementation of the convention on issues about migration the sun and dust um, drought that you just talked about our parties disagreeing on how you approach that on issues about finances that we can talk a little bit about after. I mean, what are you hearing? Um, well, I think generally it is um, it is it is mm, very constructive and and less contentious than maybe in other fora. So I'm, for example, I'm a climate person. I come from UNFCCC. So there we always have this overarching tension of it's like a blame game, right? So right. who's to blame? Who has to pay? Etc. And as one delegate I spoke to yesterday, he, he put it very clearly, he said, look, land, is, that's not the issue here, because land is our issue. We are managing our own land. Mm. Every country has to manage their own land. And of course, there are some issues about, you know, getting international um, support. So if, for example, we, we were to have a formal protocol on drought or something like that, then um, hopes would be that there would be international support for countries to deal with drought or with sand and dust storms, similar thing. 
um, but it's not as much as contentious as it is, for example, in the climate convention. Right. Um, but of course, there are always like sensitivities. There are also like regional sensitivities. There's also always sensitivities within the United Nations because you could set a precedent if you use a certain language here in this convention, then other in other convention, other fora, they could say they could point to this convention and it could try to you know inter right. integrate that. So I have seen a few things kind of like you know swapping over from uh, uh, from you know like just. So it may not be contentious here, because it, but, but because it's contentious in other places, right. um, people are a little bit cautious about the language they want to see in an official document coming out of a United Nations body. Excellent. I, if you're just joining us, uh, allow me just to say that this briefing is coming to you from Abidjan, and we are actually in Abidjan, uh, where uh, the 15th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification is holding and Garrett works uh, for the F Negotiations Bulletin. Uh, she has been supporting this process and others before, and that's why we have her this morning to sort of unpack some of the issues that are going on, you know, within, you know, closed doors here uh, at the uh, Hotel Ivoire. Uh, Garrett, um, before we came in here, there were regional consultations as well, right? So Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean, European, and uh, they all met to have at least, you know, a common position before getting here. What emerged out of these discussions, if you do have any hints that we, you can share with our reporters this morning? But yeah, so, so that's just, a, um, these discussions happen regularly because the groups try to coordinate their positions and to make sure that, and it's also, of course, if you imagine you have a plenary of 194 states, I mean, even if not everyone is here at the moment, it's a very important step in the process to pre-consolidate positions and to, to make sure that we can have progress in the actual negotiations. But what is happening within those uh, regional meetings, actually, that I cannot really give Excellent. you any intel on that. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Let's talk a little bit about finance, because that's going to be a very critical issue. Yeah, so when I listened to the, uh, uh, the head of uh, UNCCD at the opening ceremony, there was some figure, or not necessarily him, but I think it came out from the Global Land Outlook uh, report, which was launched just a week before we got here. It says more than 1.6 trillion is going to be needed for land restoration. How do we raise that money? in your opinion, and are you, are you, in terms of the pledges that we've seen here from the traditional donors, the, you know, the multilateral organizations, are we seeing some money for us to be able to address this issue? 1.6 trillion is a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. but I, I think 1.6 trillion that goes out to 2030, so it's kind of for a long time as well. Yes, exactly, be 2050, by 2030, I'm not quite sure. by 2030, by good caveat. But yeah. that's still like a, a lot of money. Um, so first thing I would want to say, and I just must say that that is kind of my personal opinion and not anything formal coming we out of this We don't mind your personal opinion. But just to say that, to caveat that, so, um, you know, you can't say these, these figures are, it's like absolute cost, but I think you always have to take into account that there is already a lot of money being put into activities concerning land. So for example, if we were to look at agricultural subsidies and the way, you know, the, the kind of food systems and food production they are supporting at the moment. And you could take part of that money and redirect it to activities that are beneficial for and that are restoring um, that are restoring landscapes as well so that is one point i think it's really important uh, in connection with uh, the financial question that it's not all about you don't have to imagine like 1.6 trillion just for big large scale restoration projects right but it's also the question of how do we redirect the financial flows we already have towards making the economic activity that is within the landscape, like mainly agriculture, also forestry, also other things, how can we redirect out those flows in order to foster a more benign, you know, kind of um, uh, way of managing our land. So that is, would be number one. And then number two is, I think there is actually a lot of money being pledged at the moment to restoration from both um, um, traditional donors, from international agencies, but also from philanthropy because we see the many benefits it has for climate resilience, for uh, mitigation as well, but also for lively, to protect the livelihoods of the people, to protect biodiversity. So I think there is actually money uh, coming. Um, the GEF has just, the Global Environmental Facility, right. has just made land one of their cross-cutting issues. And I think there's gonna be more money coming also from that side. So even though I think the UNCCD is not exactly the place where a lot of 
you know, big sums are being pledged. Um, there is money coming in, and there's also a lot of initiative on the on the business side uh, from the um, to 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 try and and support nature positive ways of um, um, of, of of management and um, how do you call that uh, of bar, um, you know, procurement um, in their supply chain. So I think Excellent. that's also an indirect flow of money that that is there on the horizon. And it's, it's important for us to take that into consideration as well. De definitely agree with you. Interesting stuff. Uh, hope that you guys are actually have finding a lot of uh, interest in this discussion with Garrett. Um, you don't get to have it all the time. So please feel free to uh, you know, send out any questions that you may have on the Q and A function, as we would do uh, every morning uh, when we have this briefing. Um, just one more question from me, then we're going to take the questions from the audience. We have seen a lot of news uh, reporting this week with respect to you know where we are. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of newspaper reporting, and you know there are titles such as "The Time Is Now for to Future Proof the Land," uh, "The World It Has Is at a Crossroad in Terms of Managing of Drought." you know, a step of action on drought, et cetera, et cetera. Are you seeing that translating into some concrete, um, you know, uh, in this platform that we're having here, are you seeing that translating some concrete action for us to be able to restore um, our, our precious land as many are calling it at this point? Yes, I, I would say like, we, we definitely see a lot of activity. I mean, even if you, if, you, if you look, for example, at the side events that are happening here. So like this COP, as every COP also is a place where, you know, kind of engaged and interested actors come together, civil society, researchers, uh, policymakers, bu private business. And there is such a, a plethora of, um, uh, of projects that are being launched, of initiatives. We heard just yesterday about the thousand uh, landscapes for one billion people network that, that that provides access and finance and and also tries to bring people together for a really integrated approach to land restoration um, so I think there's there's really some momentum um, uh, uh, here definitely I mean as always it's probably not enough to you know it's not commensurate to the urgency that 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 we see but there's a, there's there's a lot happening and maybe if I can just say this one thing about drought mm -hmm. because drought is one of the key issues in this convention and many have always felt it doesn't get enough attention right and drought is also something that is a little bit you know kind of it falls between the cracks because drought is a problem that you would look at under the climate convention because right. it's an impact of climate change it's something that you would look at under the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction because it is a disaster and also you could look at it in, in this convention. So it's kind of, it doesn't really have a home. And, um, and it, it, it sometimes, and, and, and I just talked to someone uh, yesterday uh, who's been in this for, for a very long time. And she said, now it's picking up, like they've tried to bring drought to the agenda for such a long time. And it's never really, you know, really made its way to the forefront, but that he really has the feeling that now people are listening and now that, you know, things are moving because we see so much so many impacts of drought at the moment it's getting worse and worse and we know it's going to get worse with climate change so i think drought is really something that that we, we don't expect to see a formal protocol coming out of this convention i don't i think that expectation would be um you know that would be too high i don't think we are there yet these processes just take a very long time right. within so but um, we are the, at a point where, where, where the readiness is there to actually address the issue in a, in a way that is much more, um, much more serious than, than it may have been before. I think actors have actually re-emphasized that as well. They see more uh, focus and, uh, the, you know, uh, on issues about drought in this convention than they've seen before. So uh, excellent points there. There is a question here which uh, has to do with uh, your guidance to young journalists. And I'd say many of them were joining actually young journalists. And the question here is, as a writer yourself, what advice would you give to early career journalists reporting for the last few days of the COP? Well, of course, uh, look at the Earth Negotiation Bulletin. <laughs> but uh, our summary is only going to come out two days after uh, that the COP actually closes. So um, look at the wording of the actual declaration and try to find the truth between the lines. You know, there's always a lot of like very nice words of urgency, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, try to look deeper and, and try to look for the connections to the other conventions. I think there's a very important stride that's going to go um, from here to uh, the CBD to also the UNFCCC COP in, in, in uh, November. 
Um, and maybe as a last one, I think it's always good to look at, um, you know, what the NGOs are saying, the civil societies groups that have been on the process for a long time that always have a, a very deep expertise um, on the subject matter. And they may be the ones that are commenting uh, more fact on a factual basis, more on, you know, what is actually the, the essence of the outcome here beyond just the, you know, the declaration level. And that's maybe what I what I would would say like try look at the and and the documents are going to be out there so you will be able to to look at the actual documents and um and, and see you maybe yeah see what what has been decided excellent great great uh, i have to say we're really running out of time and we have a second speaker this morning laurent uh Domenic. Uh, he uh, is from the canadian government side uh we talked a little bit about finance and support and canada uh is one of those bilateral organizations that support a lot of these actions on the ground not only in africa but i suspect in other parts in other developing parts of the world so we're going to get him in a few minutes shall i just say here that we have had garrett for the last 27 minutes and we really appreciate that you've been here to be able to provide us your thoughts i thought it was uh, fantastic to have you if anything what do we expect by friday meaning that friday it all closes what is it that we can expect in terms of you know concrete outcomes from this uh, conference of the party but we have seen now this week, um, as I said before, there has been a little bit like slower progress in the in the in the contact groups negotiations room. But now we are picking up speed. So we have seen um, a first decisions coming, uh, like the draft decision text that has been agreed on land tenure, on migration. I think on tender starts those as well. So I think by Friday we we can expect um, this COP to close on time, which is also not a given and um, that we will see commitment in the high-level declaration to the interlinkage between the three conventions to um, um, jointly uh, combat the effects of drought and sand and dust storms and also tenure rights, especially for women and marginalized communities to address this very important issue that's actually an essential enabling factor for everything that's got to do with land. I think these are kind of the major issues that, that, that may come out of this. Excellent, great. Thank you so much, Barry. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Uh, with your permission, would allow her go because she has a lot of a long day of reporting uh, ahead, uh, and we hope to uh, see you very shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you, really appreciate it. All right, so shall we now pivot over to our Canadian friends? We have with us uh, Laurent Dominique. Uh, Laurent, good morning. Uh, if you can hear me, uh, and I know that this is pretty early for you, we appreciate you joining us this morning. Would you just want to? maybe briefly speak about the actions of the Canadian government with respect to climate action in Sub-Sahara Africa. Our journalists are here, most of them from Sub-Sahara Africa. They may have a few questions for you. So would you want to take a few minutes to just give us an introductory uh, statement? Uh, needless to introduce you again, because we've done that at outset. And after that, we can get to some questions. Thank you. Over to you, Laurent. Hi, Davy. Thank you uh, uh, for hosting me this morning. Um, uh, a bit of correction, I'm connecting from Lome, Togo, so I'm in the same time zone with you. And I have some uh, slides that I want to share with you uh, supporting my presentation. So uh, I'll be sharing it. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, please. One put it on, excellent, great. Okay, thank you. So um, this morning, I want to uh, speak to you about the climate action in Africa. Uh, I have uh, like five points to discuss and that will be end by question and associations. Firstly, uh, to put in context, what is, uh, where do the climate action in Africa come from? We should know that Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for less than 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But this part of the continent, uh, the world is highly vulnerable to climate change because of poverty rates, conflicts, and a high reliance on at-risk livelihoods. So Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to experience crop failure, livestock mobility, and biodiversity loss. And, uh, is already taking climate action. So we realize also that uh, Sub-Saharan African countries are already building climate resilient green economies 
increasing the use of renewable energy and conserving and restoring forests. So the Canada's new climate action in Africa project is building on this momentum and to take it to the next level. So what is the Canada response to all the, the climate uh, uh, issues in Sub-Saharan Africa? So the Climate Action in Africa is a five-year initiative funded by Global Affairs Canada, which is part of the governments of Canada commitment of $5.3 billion to international climate finance. So the, pro the project uh, started implementations last year, this year, and will last till uh, 2025 or 2026. So the project is based on need identified at the local level, and it is a demand driven. So uh, if you have to uh, submit, uh, you have to visit our platform. I will give the link uh, later on and uh, submit your, uh, your request. And uh, eligible recipients organization include government, uh, NGOs, academia, and the private sector. But you should know that uh, uh, there's only, only uh, recipients uh, in South Sudan, Sudan, and Zimbabwe must be in, and use. So the project provides targeted short-term technical assistance uh, to projects with a maximum value of 300,000 Canadian dollar and generally will be up to one year. So part of uh, Canada International Climate Finance, Finance Commitment designed to combat climate change and biodiversity loss around the world with a focus on happy low and middle income countries already affected by climate change transition to sustainable, low carbon, climate resilience, nature positive and inclusive development. So engaging uh, Canada climate change experts uh, in the climate uh, action in Africa. So our program is not a grant project, but it is a technical assistance project. We are not giving grants, but we are offering technical assistance to support uh, project uh, design implementation and uh, monitoring and evaluation through uh, Canada's climate change experts. So our initiative will uh, mobilize Canadian expertise to help Sub-Saharan Africa countries come closer to meeting their obligations under the Paris Agreement and other UNFCCC uh, commitments. And uh, we are contributing to the global effort and the way to protect our share future. So uh, our program has like four pillars. Uh, the first one is building climate change governance and capacity, uh, which is addressed uh, mostly to government and uh, uh, civil society all around uh, climate change policy. So it's, uh, it's fall under um, pillar one. And the second pillar is about climate change mit mitigations, uh, dealing uh, precisely with energy and forestry and also adaptation focusing on water and agriculture. The third pillar is about women participation and leadership in climate action. We know that uh, women are most vulnerable to climate change but they are not contributing much and their voice are not there, uh, are, are not part of the discussion. So uh, the third pillar want to increase the voice of women and their leadership in climate action uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and even worldwide during uh, some uh, convention uh, organizations. So the fourth pillar is the cross country uh, issues uh, dealing with social cooperation and knowledge sharing. So uh, for this pillar, we intend to, we know that there are many good practices uh, undergoing in some countries uh, which are not shared. So for us, it is to support uh, the knowledge uh, that was um, produced in some parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to be shared to other parts of uh, uh, this part of the world. So what the government, governance and social cooperation is all about. It's intent to strengthen the capacity of uh, national design authorities 
decision makers and stakeholders responsible for coordinating and planning climate action at all levels. And also it is crucial for increased ambition and application of the Paris Rulebook, supporting result-oriented thought, thought knowledge and exchange between sub-Saharan Africa countries and facilitating the sharing of climate-related expertise and lessons learned. And we um, have many focuses, as I have already said, uh, at empowering women, not only as uh, observers, but as agent of change. So by identifying partnership, creating op opening and leveraging existing entry point towards encouraging women meaningful participation in climate action and access to climate finance, and also supporting implementation of the UNFCCC Gender Action Plan and increasing women participation and leadership in climate actions. So uh, concerning climate change mitigation and adaptation, as I already said, we are focusing on energy and forestry. So all initiative and action falling under renewable energy, energy efficiency and forestry are welcome. And also under adaptation, we are uh, supporting all the uh, initiative uh, concerning water resources and also agriculture. So uh, gender equitable, equitable and social inclusive climate actions as I, are, I have already said are cross cutting issues for us. So uh, uh, I am showing the process flow, the process flow for uh, submitting and having support from us. And this process uh, may last for about six months. If you submit the proposal for about six months, all this, uh, uh, you, you will be granted support. And the support will last for, so our technical assistant is a short term technical assistant. So it will last for about uh, one hour, uh, one, uh, one year. So the, our website, to submit uh, for submission and asking questions is www.climateactioninafrica.ca, Canada. So uh, this is my presentation this morning. So thank you for your attention. I am welcome. I welcome all your questions. So uh, the floor is open. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Laurent, uh, allow Welcome me to say that uh, Laurent is uh, a renewable energy advisor um, uh, of the expert deployment mechanism of the climate action uh, in Africa project. So we thank you very much. And I'm glad that you are in the same time zone with us. So you didn't have to get up too early to be able to do this. So that's great. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, let's double check. Uh, we have a Q&A function here. We've said, please put any questions that you might have right there. So there is one yet. Do you have any specific stories of success from the project that you could share with us at this point? Laurent, over to you. Um, we have just started implementation, as I have said, uh, uh, we have just started implementation, so we have not funded any initiative uh, right now, so uh, the, 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 um, our platform is available for everyone that wants to submit uh, some requests for support, so our platform is available, you can go to the uh, climateactioninafrica.ca and submit your application. We will be uh, very happy to support you. Thank you. Excellent, great, great. Uh, Leonard has a question for you. In Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, uh, are you targeting all countries? Um, and is uh, there any of your interventions in Malawi? So, uh, so far, um, yeah, because uh, let's say Leonard is from Malawi, yeah. Yes, uh, as I've said, uh, all the Sub-Saharan Africa countries are eligible, except for except from uh, Seychelles, Sudan, South Sudan, and Zimbabwe. But in goals, in NGOs, in in those countries can submit uh, some requests uh, uh, to receive. So yes, Malawi uh, is also eligible for this uh, program. Thank you. Excellent, great. I have to say that we've really gone over time, but David has a question here. How are the African governments collaborating with the program? That's David from Mauritius. Okay. Um, 
Um, for us, as I've said, it's a demand-driven uh, initiative. So um, we are partnering with some regional, we are now discussing with some regional organizations. Uh, which are working with some, which are working with government in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, our collaboration is demand-driven. So we are open to work with any governmental agencies that is requiring support uh, for its climate action. Thank you. Excellent, great. Uh, as I said, we've really gone overboard. Uh, but Laurent, I hope you understand. Uh, normally we would. I want to close this by this time. Anything that you'd want the reporters this morning to retain from uh, what you wanted to uh, share with them? Is there any one or two things that you might want them to retain from uh, uh, from your from your end? Yes, uh, if there's something to uh, keep in mind is that uh, Canada has a technical assistance a program called Climate Action in Africa. So, which is ongoing implementation till 2025 and 2026, and it's open to all sub-Saharan African countries. So if you have any initiative ongoing uh, on ground that requires support, technical assistance support, we are open to support you. So you just go to our platform on climateactioninafrica.ca and submit your a request or question, and we'll be happy to be supporting you. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, for hosting me, and thanks to all the team. You're welcome, and thanks for your patience, Laurent. With that, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, we're pretty much drawing to the close of this uh, morning's briefing. Two more to go tomorrow, and obviously on Friday, we shall be bringing you uh, probably, you know, um, information with respect to the draft text that we have at this point, uh, wherever there is consensus and if there are any other issues that are still to be discussed, we'll make sure that we bring that over to you so that that can inform your reporting from wherever you are. We want to thank you so much. Thank our two guests this morning, Garrett and Laurent for coming and taking time off to be with us. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and bye-bye for now.